dream of man to escape from the gravity of Earth and soar through the heavens is older than history. In the past quarter century, that dream has come true. At present, only a few well-trained voyagers can sail the new ocean of space. But all of us can experience the thrills of spaceflight through pictures. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, has created a unique and outstanding film record that will stretch your sensors and your mind in time and space. Hello, I'm Jim Lovell, and it's my pleasure to introduce this remarkable pictorial history called America's Achievements in Space. This series includes every important film made by NASA. They have been assembled by the Eastern Press to enable you to view the official record of the conquest of space right in your own home. I flew on four space missions, and such pictures helped me prepare for orbits around the Earth and Moon. The films taken on my flights helped engineers and scientists plan the next steps. In this videotape program and subsequent programs, you'll see countless images that gave astronauts and scientists a new view of space. Some were taken by cameras positioned where humans cannot go, close to the fiery blasts of rocket engines, or mounted on robot spacecraft crashing or landing on the lunar surface. Watching these pictures, you'll see what electronic eyes saw on Mars and what human eyes saw from spaceships. I'll never forget the excitement of seeing the entire Earth in the window of an Apollo spacecraft, then looking down to see the craters and lava seas on the lunar surface. This series will bring you all of these sights, as if you had been there. You will see liftoffs, dramatic recoveries, spacewalks, moonwalks, even rambling rides on a lunar vehicle. You will see it all. These first two tapes will give you a remarkable sampling of what's to come, taking you first through an early essay on space photography, onto the Glenn flight, then Apollo 8, Gemini 4, and to Mars aboard Mariner 9. All of these using some of the most spectacular footage ever taken. The films in this extraordinary collection were taken by NASA to provide official documentation of every accomplishment and thrill. They are the best photographs. They are history. Of course, not all of the pictures are perfect. Some of them were taken under extreme conditions of light, of weather, distance, and teeth rattling vibrations. Some are even 25 years old. But they are all exciting and interesting. Together they comprise the official record. Watching them is the next best thing to being there and owning them is owning a fascinating piece of history. But take John Glenn's flight. In February 1962, he became the first American to orbit Earth. The pictures and sound not only record what he saw from his Friendship 7 capsule, but the sounds of his heart, uh, the expressions on his face, the tension and relief in his voice. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of the story. Sit back and relax and see it all for yourself.
came from the Chinese philosopher Confucius. One picture is worth a thousand words. Well then, what is the value of a thousand pictures? Ten thousand. Of things never before seen or experienced. cameras of space provide the images and the images themselves help provide the answers. By the time this film is over you will have seen more than 20,000 separate images from these and other cameras of things either never seen or experienced. The earth, the moon, the sun and the stars. The images of the space program this new view of space are but mere extensions of man. They show him things he cannot see or easily perceive. They magnify or make smaller. They freeze time and event for later study. And they compress time for the same purpose. They help us to find the peculiar reality that is space. This film is a record, a partial record, of those images. Images of airplanes on the very edge of space and rockets exceeding the limits of Earth. Images of a satellite unfolding itself to perform in orbit. We've studied the habits of liquids in zero gravity and in the same condition the habits of man. We've watched men go about their professional duties, American men, Russian men. And we've watched them in more personal moments. The images show us materials under brutal heat and pressure, and the designs for new vehicles. Through these pictures, we've watched a wheel on the moon and on a wet runway. They've taught man how to land on another planet and at a small town airport. The images show us the airplanes of tomorrow and the violent waves left behind, the vortex of air and the vortex of fuel at zero gravity. We've seen man on the moon and the rocks he's collected from the outside and the inside. And questions, how do crystals grow? What is light, energy? How do cells grow? What is life? Throughout, we've seen the faces of men, men under stress. The faces of yesterday's missions today's flights and tomorrow's journeys. Small events, big occasions, the cameras were there. Big occasion, the launch of a Saturn rocket. The press, the curious, the sightseers have not yet arrived with their cameras and lenses and film. But the engineers and technicians have with theirs. Nearly 200 cameras and thousands of feet of film wait to be exposed. Some cameras are only inches away, housed in steel boxes with Pyrex lenses. 200 eyes, all focused on one object.
launch pad cameras have shut down and the tracking cameras take over, providing a visual record of the flight, automatically following the rocket as it flings its human cargo into orbit. On the ground, they study the pictures, examine every minute detail. The film yields up vital information on the performance of virtually everything associated with the launch. During the time of launch, a central timing facility was feeding impulses to each camera. The film was marked, so now they can pinpoint the precise time of every picture to within a thousandth of a second. Even before the launch, pictures of static test firings tell them how the rocket's engines behaved under controlled conditions. And where there is failure, the pictures tell why and point the way towards solutions. Failure or success. Failure and success. Photography, linked to new techniques and developed to new levels of sophistication, provides a means of measuring performance of the intricate machines of the space age. But not only on the ground, the machines take their cameras with them inside and take their own pulse and temperature readings. Separation of the stages. Did it occur as planned? The dynamics of fuel in a weightless state. Did it work as theory said it would? Again, the pictures provide answers, but not easily. The stages of the rocket drop away and plunge back to Earth, and the cameras and their pictures are fished from the oceans of the world. The answers they provide are worth the search. And the men of space take their cameras with them, measuring performance, but also providing a visual record of the strange reality they experience. And in the process, they provide us with a record of the sublime beauty of space. In giving us a record of the beauty of space, they also present us with a portrait of ourselves, startling and beautiful. Some dim perceptions, some hint of questions not answered, some suggestions of problems and solutions begin to rise to the surface, but not so fast as to obliterate our surprise at the beauty of this tiny blue planet. Pictures of Earth also record the problems. They give us data we need for action. Agnes, Beulah, Cindy, Debbie. Those devastating women of the hurricane season have been tracked, pinpointed, evaluated through the use of satellite pictures. Before the first weather satellite, Tyros, our knowledge of the weather was limited largely to what was happening in our backyard. But the view has expanded even from those early days. We can now watch weather patterns across the face of the globe. We've gained new understandings of the dynamics of weather and have developed ways of translating those understandings into vital applications. The weather pictures are studied, scrutinized, evaluated, checked one against the other. And they're checked against the data from other sources, ground stations, local observations. The process is a fusion, a blending of a number of complex elements. The perceptions of man, his background and experience, the machine, electronics and optics. They all play an important role in this process and photography is central to the drama. Weather pictures, for example, no longer are received at exotic receiving stations. Automatic picture transmission can bring satellite pictures of weather to any user 
through relatively simple and inexpensive equipment. In this fusion of elements, the raw data is coupled with man's understanding and then given over to the technology of the computer age. The result, forecasts of long range covering wide areas, not only for our own backyard, but for those around the world. We no longer wait for the rain to fall. If the rain is more than incidental and is coupled with high winds and high tides, then such knowledge is critical. A hurricane is seen from a satellite. Hurricane Camille in the Gulf of Mexico, bearing down on the Gulf Coast. But it's seen in a way that would boggle the imagination of early weather watchers. It's seen as different colors, and not just for the sake of color. Each color on the scale, each gradation of color, represents important information. Temperature readings which, in turn, give clues to the intensity of the storm, its path, its probable behavior. The techniques developed during the early years are refined. The technology is pushed. The minds of men are stretched. And the lives of people are saved. In the course of the space program, the men, their machines, and their cameras left the Earth and its orbit and extended the search beyond. 1964, the Ranger spacecraft sped toward the moon and sent us back our first close pictures. We watched as the spacecraft headed toward impact, surprised, intrigued, awed. And then, Lunar Orbiter. It circled the moon, sending back pictures of startling clarity. And we began to fill in the details of the geography of the moon. Fouth, the keyhole crater. And just beyond, Copernicus. For the first time, we grasped part of the meaning. The moon, too, has its canyons and mountains and valleys. The scientists began a systematic job of mapping the surface. One day, men would go there. But before that, their sense of sight, remotely controlled and contained in a spacecraft, had to go first. And the revelations were there. Impact craters and rills. Examples of ancient lava flows. Chaotic terrain. We saw the terraced walls of craters and craters within craters. And for the first time so clearly, we saw the so-called dark side of the moon, the other side. In the workroom and laboratory, man paced off the surface of the moon. And then, the real thing. Again, pictures provide a record of accomplishment and achievement, and important scientific information. The footprint of man preceded by that of an earlier visitor, surveyor. It had landed and provided much needed information on the surface of the moon, scraping and digging and photographing the results. And through the use of a special device, converting black and white images into color, details, clues, things that had to be known before the first astronaut touched down. And even after the manned landings, Surveyor continued to provide information. By checking on its condition, the man on the moon learned something about the moon itself. The astronaut did something else, too. Something that all visitors to a strange land do. He posed in front of an imposing landmark, 
one he brought along for the occasion. The names of the places visited still ring in our ears, Sea of Tranquility and Fra Mauro, the Ocean of Storms and Littro. He used these pictures to define the limits of himself and his machine and measured the performance of both against those defined limits. Increased mobility gave him more freedom, freedom to move farther and farther away from the mother ship. He could now move across the nearest hill and down into the nearest valley, seeing things he would not otherwise see. New tools and new technologies were harnessed for this quest for knowledge. The spaceman, the astronaut, sent back an instantaneous record of his accomplishments, a quarter of a million miles in a fraction of a minute. Turnabout, then, is fair play. We sent signals back to him, telling him what we wanted to see, even controlling the actions of his television cameras. And throughout the world, people watched. We soon learned that television was no gimmick. Apollo 13 brought the message home. Television gave ground controllers instant sight and insight and permitted them to make lightning fast decisions to save the lives of three men in a damaged spacecraft a quarter of a million miles from home. Back in the laboratories of Earth, we learned to learn new things from the samples brought back from the moon. Specialized optical and photographic techniques are used to query the sample, to go backwards in time. How far back? Four billion years? Four and a half billion? Photography helps to scrape away the layers of centuries and magnify the detail that would escape the naked vision of man. A glass bead from the surface of the moon. It's magnified. Then again. And then? Again, as if we were peering into other worlds, other universes, asking more questions. We also reach out to other worlds, other planets, to Mars. In a room in California, a room jammed with electronic and optical equipment, they waited for the first close-up look at Mars, a look to be provided through the cameras aboard a spacecraft that would glide by, clicking its shutters every 48 seconds. And it came only one year after Ranger sent back its pictures of the moon. Mariner had done its job well, and others were to follow, will follow, adding to the storehouse of information. The details fill in and the scientists find striking similarities between Mars and the Moon, and some striking differences. Craters, like the Moon. Polar ice caps, like the Earth. And a Moon of its own, one of two photographed by Mariner. And what does it all mean? Is there water on Mars, a form of life, Scientists continue to debate the issues, but slowly the mystery is being stripped away. The computer lends valuable assistance, wringing from the pictures clues and secrets. Interference patterns are translated into enhanced and clarified pictures of the Martian surface. Then if it works for Mars, why not for other planets? Our own, Earth. The irony of ecology. The farther we moved away, the closer we came to understanding the importance of our own environment, of simple, peaceful lands, and how to save them. And disasters, and how to fight them, control them. The forest fire is seen from orbit, pinpointed for those on the ground. Accumulated technology is now harnessed to preserve our own planet. The Earth Resources Technology Satellite, Earths. It's a big step in that direction. It looks at the Earth through completely new eyes, feeding us vital information on ourselves, 
it also returns telemetry data from ground-based stations, serving as a sort of orbiting collector of information. 500 miles above the Earth, it tells us the things we need to know. And Earth's, coupled with Skylab and Space Shuttle, will provide unprecedented opportunities for new views as we monitor the resources of the Earth. We also receive information on our growing urban centers, information on sources of pollution, population density, terrain conditions for future expansion or for future conservation. Leave the generalities and look at the specifics. An orange grove is infected with blight and an infrared photograph tells the grower the extent of blight. From this he will deduce a solution. The techniques are varied. A basic color photograph is subjected to different filters, layers of color, and each layer provides new information. The same techniques, with variations, can be used to detect a wide variety of problems which threaten the resources and people of the Earth. And the results are being made available to people the world over for the solution of problems. example, multispectral photography. It reads the non-visible parts of the spectrum, X-ray, ultraviolet, infrared, thousands of images providing information and understanding that is beyond value. The promised 20,000 images of this film have almost all passed before our eyes, but others are to come. Images of the future this new view of space. It also provides us with a new view, a new understanding of ourselves and our role in that future.
astronaut John Glenn into orbit around the world. Reporting to the British Broadcasting Corporation in London. The zero hour for Colonel Glenn's launch. General in Floride, where, once again, the last minutes of departure of the American astronaut. It's been 30 minutes for American astronaut John Glenn on Camp Canaveral, Florida. يتحضر مرة ثانية لدورته حول العالم. فلوريدا جو كان فاكو تايكون خانشيران يوهان جيلين. كيف كان بيرالدا؟ أمريكا من وجوه كوشي جون غرين نصوكيو مكزني. جيتو ميركوريو أن رابطوا كي أمبوس الأستروناوتا وسو كويتي فرنشيب سيتي. and report the astronauts condition as excellent. Colonel Glenn at Cape Canaveral. And then astronaut Glenn, where weather still remains the big question mark. But the countdown for Colonel John Glenn, the countdown is again underway. With the entire world as our witness, the countdown begins at Cape Canaveral, Florida, for one of man's greatest adventures. It begins here, with these men, for they are the launch team. And from now until the instant of flight, the fate of today's mission rests principally upon their skills and judgments. The countdown is their master plan and they proceed through its ritual with unhurried deliberation. Its pages contain the timetable of order they must follow to awaken a giant machine, to test its readiness, and to prime it for the one supreme moment for which it was created. Now, meter reads 19 volts. Trouble, stand by on. Now, meter reads 11.5. Six volt isolated... Minute after minute, page upon page, the count continues. And in the night beyond this blockhouse, a modified Air Force Atlas rocket now hums with restless energy beneath a Mercury spacecraft as these men usher it toward its final minutes on Earth. Today is February 20th, 1962. And today, if all goes well, the men here will launch an American astronaut into orbit around the world in a spacecraft which he has named Friendship 7. Friendship 7 awaits its pilot, and the pilot has waited three years for this day. Three long, arduous years of study, of training, of waiting. And now he's ready. His name is John Glenn. Astronaut John Glenn of New Concord, Ohio. Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps. Married, father of two teenage children. Glenn has been a pilot over half of his 40 years, has flown in two wars, and is a veteran test pilot who five years earlier established a transcontinental flight record as the first man to average supersonic speeds across America. He volunteered for space flight. Is one of seven astronauts selected for Project Mercury, the man in space program directed by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <laughs> Two teammates have pioneered the way into space for Glenn. Astronauts Alan Shepard and Virgil Grissom tested the Mercury spacecraft on trailblazing suborbital missions, proving the equipment 
and pushing the program to the threshold of orbital flight. And now, it's Glenn's turn. Ready for pressurization? Now to Glenn falls the challenge of man's next advance into space for he has been chosen to cross the threshold gained by Shepard and Grissom and to orbit the world. So the countdown continues for John Glenn. And it continues beyond this room for Friendship 7. And it continues this moment around the world. John Glenn's ground-based co-pilots, men he knows well, with whom he's trained, and in whose judgment his life is entrusted this day. They are the flight controllers, and from the Mercury Control Center, within view of the launch complex, they make the decisions, issue the commands that will govern the course of the mission. To these men throughout the flight will flood the facts needed for decision the scope of their responsibility of the entire operation defies comprehension. Now, this very instant, the countdown for flight continues around the world, on three continents, on islands, in ships and planes, in lands where it's summer and tomorrow is near, in lands where it's winter, and this day is just beginning. Roger, how about you recovery? Recovery, go. Roger, recovery. Uh, Roger, CTC, Mercury Control Sirens, go. Northeast of Cape Canaveral, 1,000 miles into the Atlantic, dawn's early light spills over the British Crown Colony of Bermuda, and Station 2 in the Mercury Network proceeds with the countdown. The tracking and telemetry stations, 18 and all, form an avenue of electronic checkpoints around the world to monitor and communicate with Friendship 7 as it passes overhead. then telemetry is the ears. Each second, telemetry will hear and record nearly 2,000 items of information radioed down from Friendship 7. And in the months to come, engineers and scientists will find in telemetry records the answers needed for the bolder space explorations of the future. Displays and recorders have been calibrated. Roger, thank you. Flight, this is m Go ahead, m All subsystems status green. Roger, m Understand all systems green. Latitude, 5 degrees north. Longitude, 10 degrees west. A spot in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa. And Station 3, the Rose Knot, waits under the late morning sun for John Glenn. Operating out of Trinidad, Rose Knot will communicate with Friendship 7 and monitor its journey as it streaks across the empty ocean and out over Africa. Operation, this is Bridge. We're proceeding at slow speed at about five knots. The course is 198 through over. Mercury Station on Gran Canary Island in the Spanish archipelago off of the African coast. It's midday at Station 5 in Kano, Nigeria, deep in the continent of Africa. 
Flight data recorded here at Kano and at Zanzibar on Africa's east coast were relayed through this transmitting station to London and then on to America. Far to the southeast of Kano, beyond the Zanzibar station, the ship's bell of the coastal sentry tolls the twilight of day in the emptiness of the Indian Ocean. To the east, some 2,500 miles from the coastal sentry, dust blankets the network eight station at Muche, near Perth, Western Australia, halfway around the world from Cape Canaveral. The printout, color display. Okay, that's fine. Just uh, tweak it up on here. Today, February 20th, is fast fading over the Australian tracking sites at Muche and Woomera. And when Glenn arrives, tomorrow we'll greet him. But north and east across the Pacific, far beyond the Mercury Station on the coral atoll called Canton Island, February 20th is just minutes old on Hawaii's garden island of Kauai. And there, men prepare for the arrival of Friendship 7. ready for one six five check. Roger. Okay, Peter, All right, Eastward again, deeper into the day that will soon awaken over the Americas. Eastward to the Gulf of California and to the Mercury Station at Wymas, Mexico. Real good. Just waiting for liftoff. Status Gree, proceeding with pre-pass calibrations. North of Mexico, in the pre-dawn along the west coast of the United States, the mountaintop station at Point Arguello, California, waits out the long countdown, ready to track John Glenn. Uh, Roger, Aggie. What is the present count? Uh, Roger. Southeast now, to the farmlands of Texas, where the station at Corpus Christi continues its preparations for flight. I must count in Texas, please. Okay, permanent. Roger. All systems, would you please commence pre-flight calibrations at this time, since the countdown is progressing normally. Advise me when you have completed them. Far to the north and east of Corpus Christi, beats the heart of the worldwide Mercury Network, the computing and communication center that bonds it into a working entity. This is the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Through here funnels the voice and teletype communications that link the global stations to Mercury control. The computers enable men to reach judgments within the flashes of time allowed for control of a spacecraft that moves faster than a brain can react. Throughout the flight, the computers will generate recommendations on whether the mission should continue or be aborted. They will determine locations of the spacecraft, the time it should begin re-entry, the point at which it will land. And the most vital of these findings will be transmitted instantaneously to Cape Canaveral. the world, all is ready. The men, the stations, the space vehicle. And now reporters learn from the astronaut's information officer if the most vital of all elements is ready, the man himself, John Glenn.
are the thoughts of a man about to rocket into history. Glenn is the astronaut, the man who will challenge space. But he is just one member of an international scientific endeavor that requires the genius and skills of some 40,000 other men and women scattered throughout the world. From the engineers and technicians who produce the space vehicle to the crews now preparing to launch it. From the tracking experts who will chart his voyage around the globe to the sailors now waiting at sea to recover him. Behind this day stands years of preparation, of research and testing, of planning and training. And the purpose of it all is knowledge. Knowledge of space and of how effectively man and spacecraft can function together in its hostile environment. Knowledge that will serve as the basis for space explorations of the future. Hard-won knowledge of benefit to all men, bought by sacrifice and dedication and courage.
sound of John Glenn's life. His heartbeat you hear will flow from Friendship 7 throughout the flight, informing those on the ground how well he endures the trials ahead. Into the soft light of this Florida dawn emerges Friendship 7, making its debut to the day of its destiny. Atlas stands alone, waiting to depart this Earth. A quarter of a million pounds of rocket, with thrust equal to three and a half million horsepower. All to hurdle a 168-pound astronaut into space. closer to the moment of flight, and recovery teams here at the Cape and around the world ready themselves to aid the astronaut. Above all else, John Glenn's safety is paramount, the dictating factor in all planning. Never in all of history have so many people shared, without censorship, an adventure of such magnitude. Through all news media in all languages, all the peoples of the world are witness to this exploration of space, to its success or failure. Systems. Go. Range operations. Clear to 
Yeah. Mercury 30. capsule, go. All pre-start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oil evacuate. Mercury umbilical clear. Mercury is evacuate. Go. Lights on. All recorders to fast. T-minus 18 seconds and counting engine start. You May the wee ones be with you, Thomas. Good Lord, ride all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, Uh, 
Roger reports everything okay, all systems okay. Good voice contact both ways. Roger. Uh, Friendship, 7, anything to report on control system checks? Uh, not yet. Everything appears to be going okay. I'm now on the yaw part of the check. We are right on schedule. Very good, very good. Oh, so far is excellent. Very good. No problems at all so far on control. Uh, Roger. Friendship 7, it's Bermuda. You're cutting out on UHF. Uh, if you read, go to HF. Roger, going. Friendship 7, Bermuda Capcom on HF. Friendship 7, Friendship 7. Friendship 7, I'll read you very weak. Uh, give me your status on control system check, please. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, clear Capcom. Africa races Friendship 7 at 17,545 miles an hour, 300 miles a minute, four miles for every heartbeat of John Glenn. Friendship 7 streaks through the night of tomorrow and races toward the dawn of yesterday. Above the Indian Ocean flashes Friendship 7, far beyond human sight, seen only by the electronic instruments of the coastal sentry as she records the lightning passage of the man in space. John Glenn, the familiar time references of Earth no longer apply, for he journeys around our world in just 88 minutes, outracing the sun that needs 24 hours to circle the same globe.
Get him in sight. Uh, Roger. Uh, any symptoms of uh, vertigo or nausea at all? Over. And uh, negative. No symptoms whatsoever. I feel fine. Over. Good show. Oh, Roger. I do have uh, a light in sight on the ground. Over. Uh, Roger. I understand. They're just off to your right there. That's affirmative. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of lights. Apparently, right on the coast. Uh, I can see a, the outline of a town and a very bright light just to the south of it. Hey, Roger, that's Perth and Rockingham you're seeing there. Uh, Roger, the lights show up very well. And thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Uh, Roger, sure well, John. Friendship 7 streaks home, an unseen comet darting across the land of its origin. Canaveral contact, how do you copy, over? Uh, Friendship 7 uh, to Canaveral, uh, read you loud and clear, how me, over? Roger, Friendship 7, Canaveral contact, read loud and clear, stand by the Capcom, please. Roger. Uh, Roger, still reading you. Uh, 7, this is Cape Coda, Bermuda now. Uh, Roger, this is Friendship 7. Friendship 7, this is Bermuda Capcom. Uh, Roger, this is Friendship 7. I'm controlling fly by wire present time. I have no uh, left jaw, low thrust. Minor trouble aboard Friendship 7. A malfunction in the automatic control system was causing the spacecraft to yaw in skid-like fashion, away from its proper flight attitude. But Glenn is overriding the faulty system and now manually controls Friendship 7 on fly-by-wire, directing its movements by hand control, much like a pilot flies a plane. fly-by-wire at present time. Understand? Friendship 7, this is Kano Capcom standing by. Hello, Kano. Friendship 7, we have uh, telemetry solid and check all your systems out okay. Uh, we will remind you to start uh, pre dark side uh, checklist as soon as you lose contact with us. Hello, right, your Friendship 7. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is Muge Comtek. Friendship 7, this is Muge Comtek. Do read, over. Your friendship 7, we say Capcom. Uh, will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center off position. Uh, Roger, you haven't had any uh, banging noises or anything of this type at higher rates. Negative. Uh, Roger, this, they wanted this answer. Uh, Masked behind that routine report, the, the first hint of potential disaster. It came when astronaut Cooper relayed a request from Mercury Control asking Glenn to check the status lights for the capsule's landing impact bag. Glenn reports, status normal. But ground stations are now receiving an ominous chilling signal, an indication that the heat shield on Friendship 7 seems to have come loose. Friendship 7, Hawaii contact. Hawaii, Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Hawaii Capcom. Do you still consider yourself go for the next orbit? Affirmative. I am go for the next orbit. Roger, understand. MCC confirms that they are go at the present time for third orbit. Friendship 7, Friendship 
7, this is California Com Tech. California Com Tech, do you read? Over. Hello, California Com Tech, Craig Ship 7, loud and clear, how many? Roger, Craig Ship 7, this is California Cap Car, where's your line clear, John? Uh, Roger, repeating, you're much better now, Wally, uh, very good. Uh, uh, John, the Aeromeds are real happy with you, you look real good up there. All right, fine, glad everything's working out. I feel real good, Wally, no problems at all. Good show. We're real pleased to let you go by this time, we'll see you next time around. This is Mercury Control. We now have a contact with our Guaymas, Mexico station and with the Corpus Christi, Texas tracking station. The Friendship 7 spacecraft is now committed to its third orbit. This is Mercury Control. In Mercury Control at Cape Canaveral, a decision must be made, and soon. The signal pulsing down from Friendship 7 indicates still that the heat shield is loose. Could the signal be erroneous? There is no way to tell. But if it's true, then John Glenn could perish in a searing inferno when he plunges back into the atmosphere. The retro rockets that slow the spacecraft and head it back toward Earth are strapped over the shield. If they were left on after retro fire, instead of being jettisoned as in normal re-entry, then their straps might hold the shield in place before they burn off. They might possibly save Glenn from the 3,000 degrees of re-entry heat until he's deep enough into the atmosphere for its force to hold the shield in place. But the decision must be made soon. Even now, Glenn is streaking toward the United States, and he must begin the retro sequence 300 miles west of California if he's to land in the planned recovery area 700 miles south and east of Florida. We'll give you the countdown uh, for retro sequence time, John. You're looking good. Uh, Roger, we only have five zero seconds to retrograde. Over. Uh, that's a firm. I'll give you a mark. Uh, 45 mark. California, uh, California. This is Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. So keep tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. 20 Please. seconds. Roger.
Uh, Roger, retracting scope manually. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Uh, we see no difficulty at this time in that type of re-entry. Over. Uh, Roger. Understand. heat of re-entry has created a barrier of ionization around Friendship 7, halting all voice communication. Alone, he plunges back toward Earth, a fiery meteorite. Thickening atmosphere breaks his descent, slowing Friendship 7 from 17,500 miles an hour to 1,300 miles an hour in slightly over three minutes. And the forces of gravity slam against John Glenn until he weighs eight times his normal weight. Friendship 7, but John Glenn uh, cannot again. hear the message. Right around 443, flight. That was about on time. Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. I Friendship 7, this is Cape. How do you read, over? Uh, All right, you're reading loud and clear. How you doing? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. Re-entry checklist complete. Standing by for a minute and ten. Roger, 
Thank you. 